Welcome to Linguini and Literature. I'm Charlie Carrillo. I'm going to show you how to make a wonderful inexpensive red sauce while I tell you about my wonderful inexpensive books. We're going to start with a little bit of garlic and some olive oil. Put down a nice bed of that. Four or five cloves of chopped garlic. You really can't use too much. Just when it begins to brown at the edges, we're going to add some other ingredients. The garlic is browned at the edges. In goes the celery, in goes the shredded carrots. Now while all this stuff gets acquainted, I'm going to tell you about my first published novel, Shepherd Avenue, 1986. Beautiful story. That uh, beautiful jacket illustration is by my father. It's the story of a 10-year-old boy who spends a very strange summer at his grandmother's house in the East New York section of Brooklyn after his mother dies. He's a sheltered kid from the suburbs. Suddenly he's in this world of really tough Italian people. It was a tough sell because it's a story about a child, but it's not a children's book, and the publishers get very nervous about things like that. My agent worked hard to sell it, calls me up one day finally. She says, hey, go celebrate. It's sold. You're getting $6,500 advance. I said, great. I put my jacket on. I ran out of the house. Well, before I got to the door, the phone rang again. The agent says, I was wrong. It's not 6,500, it's 4,500. And I said, who cares? It's still a sale. I was so relieved. This was before I ever cared about money. Uh, if that happened to me now, I'd take hostages till I got that two grand back. Anyway, Shepherd Avenue got good reviews. I didn't make much money off it. I never got a royalty check. And it even had movie interest. At one point, Frank Sinatra was offered a million dollars. A million dollars was a lot then to play the grandfather. But at this point in his life, he was reading the lyrics to my way off a teleprompter. So there's no way he was ever gonna learn his lines for a movie script. Anyway, Frank said no, and uh, that was the story of Shepherd Avenue. These vegetables have to get very soft before we go to the next stage. 10 years went by before my second book got sold. 10 years, 10 years. By this time, I did care about money quite a bit. I was a father, I was a little bit in the hole. So I told myself I'd write a book to make money. Now, usually that doesn't work. It's like swinging too hard for a home run and you hit nothing. But this time I hit it out of the park. The name of the book is My Ride with Gus. Jacket illustration, once again, by my dad. My Ride with Gus is a natural for the movies. A straight arrow architect gets into trouble. He accidentally kills a woman. The only one who can help him is his mafioso brother, whom he hasn't seen in 20 years. They collect the body and spend a night trying to figure out what to do with it as they drive around Brooklyn. Anyway, the movie interest was immediate. Really, really spirited. I got 50 grand, 50 grand advance for the book and a couple of hundred grand for the movie rights, which enabled me to purchase this 375 square foot palace. In any event, they were all set to do the movie and the names that got kicked around. Ray Romano, Leonardo DiCaprio, John Travolta, Alec Baldwin, oh man. And then, suddenly, they didn't want it. That's how it works in Hollywood. They're very interested, and then they're not interested in all. It drops. Their interest will drop like a stone off a cliff. All right, that's fine. Ten years go by. I get a call from my agent. Ten years. Another ten years. And she says, go celebrate. The project's been green-lighted. My ride with Gus. I said, great. She said, there's only one thing. It's for an all-black cast. I said, an all-black cast? It's a mafia story. She said, well, this is what they're doing. I said, well, if it's an all-black cast, why don't they make it Porgy and Gus make a musical? Go all the way. I called the screenwriter. Heavy hitter in Hollywood, screenwriter from My Ride with Gus. He says, hey, Charlie, problem is, Hollywood's all mafia out. Godfather, one, two, three, Donnie Brasco, good fellas, too much. Now we'll go with the black audience. It won't do as well in Europe. Well, we'll go to Denzel Washington, we'll go to Samuel L. Jackson, we'll go to Morgan Freeman, we'll get it done. Hey, oh, ooh. Anyway, that went away too. Ten years from now, I'll get a call from my agent saying, go celebrate. The Chinese are going to make it. We'll probably get Jeremy Lin to star in it if his knees hold up. And a buddy of mine suggested a great title for my ride with Gus in China, Mugu Gus Pan. Oh, that'll play internationally. My ride with Gus is an unusually touching story considering it's about two guys riding around Brooklyn in the middle of the night trying to get rid of a dead body in the trunk. <laughs> All right, crushed tomatoes go in next. Crushed, not pureed, crushed. And this is good stuff. All right. They really did me wrong in my third book. It's called Raising Jake. <sighs> that title. The original title is 
Your mother will kill us when she finds out. Now that's a title that goes right to anybody's core. We've all had that fear of our mothers because the mother is the law. Anyway, they changed the title of my book to Raising Jake, which sounds like a Lifetime original movie about a single mom with a troubled teen. If you were casting it, you'd use Morgan Fairchild and Justin Bieber. And that's exactly what the book isn't. But a bunch of liberal arts majors at the publishers changed the title to Raising Jake. It's the story of a divorced dad who loses his job on the same day his son gets kicked out of prep school. Father and son spend a lost weekend together that's actually a found weekend. It's a wonderful story. I do say so myself. And the last few pages of that book are probably the best thing I've ever written. If they don't take your breath away, then you really don't have breath to lose. Raising Jake. All right, once we got this simmering, a little splash of red wine, not expensive, just any kind of red wine, because I'll tell you something, the tomato and the grape, that is an electric wedding. Salt and pepper as well. Lots of pepper. And just a few shakes of salt, and it gives it a good richness. The thing to do now is put the flame on very low and let this sauce simmer like an Italian nursing a grudge. One Hit Wonders, my fourth book. One Hit Wonders, my first shot at a love story. I thought it would make me rich, and I was wrong. I guess it's a little bit of a clumsy story in a way, but love is clumsy, so <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Anyway, it's the story of a kid who gets his heart broken when he's a teenager because his girlfriend runs off. So he writes a ballad about his broken heart that makes him famous and rich when he's just a kid. Flash forward 20 years later, He's flat broke, he moves back in with his parents. There's a nightmare. And the girl is back in the neighborhood too. Will they get together again? Of course they will. Why would I write a book if they didn't? Anyway, one hit wonder, I like it a lot. It probably would have sold better if I'd made everybody zombies or vampires because uh, that seems to be the winning formula these days. Ooh. Guess you want to stir so there's no sticking. Found Money is my latest. It's the story of a yuppie couple who buy a house in Brooklyn and a fortune falls out of the ceiling in a steel box while they're renovating the ceiling. And this dirty money turns everybody's lives upside down. Uh, never got a proper publisher, but I made about $40,000 in movie options. The actor Dennis Farina bought it year after year. Oh, sure, yeah. Had a screenplay written, it was good to go. And nothing happened, but I did get paid. I'm very fond of found money. I think it works as a story. I think it works as a fable. So I put it on Amazon Kindle myself. No agent, no publisher. Brave new world, man. Bareback riding. Yeah. So sometimes people say to me, what's your favorite of your books? And people say, well, you can't pick a favorite book because it's like trying to pick a favorite child. Nobody has a favorite child. That's a lie too. Parents have a favorite child. They just don't admit it. But I would say my favorite of the vibe is Shepherd Avenue, but maybe only because uh, it was my first, and uh, there's no repeating that first thrill. The next stage of this is the draining, the spaghetti draining. For this, you need what my grandmother called a scholabast, a spaghetti strainer, a scholabast. People whose names do not end in a vowel call this a colander. Honey, where's the colander? We want to be authentic here. Well, you put the colander in the sink, Make sure the drain's clear. All right, dump that fast. A little shaking action, there she goes. This whole meal is only a couple of bucks. Mmm, that's good stuff. That's a linguine, a sprinkle of cheese or salt, and pepper, whatever you like, and you've got a nice meal for yourself. Uh, this is a good thing to know how to do, especially if you like reading and if you like writing, because chances are if you read and you write a lot, you don't have that many friends. And the friends you do have probably get on your nerves. So this is a relaxing way to spend time. I've had better ideas frying garlic than I ever had sitting in any classroom. And let's face it, reading and eating, two greatest pleasures in life. Well, two out of the three. Thanks for watching.